welcome this evening. I'm Sophronia Scott, Program Director for the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing, and welcome to the MFA Residency Experience, 10 Magical Days in Community. Uh, we're going to speak tonight about a, a very important aspect of our MFA program and share our experiences with you. But to begin with, let's tell you who is with us this evening. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Sophronia Scott. I'm the founding director of the program. And I live in Connecticut, but I am in Michigan a lot, which is where the program is based. And that is where I'm coming to you tonight. I'm in my office at Alma College. So welcome. We have three faculty members from our program with us this evening. I will let them introduce themselves, uh, Karen and Leslie and uh, Bob Vivian. But Karen, you're on the screen first. So I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Karen Bender. I'm, um, I teach uh, fiction and I can also uh, do nonfiction mentoring. Um, and I uh, am in, I recently, uh, me and my husband recently moved to Brooklyn um, after teaching in North Carolina, and Virginia for many years. And um, I have uh, been at Alma the last uh, year teaching and from the beginning and um, welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. And Leslie. Hi, I'm Leslie Contreras Schwartz and I am a mentor for poetry and creative nonfiction students. I'm from Houston uh, where I live now. Um, I love visiting Michigan. You know, it's a novelty to me to be in that type of weather. Um, the residencies are really special and I think that students and faculty really enjoy them. Um, and the thing I like about teaching for Alma is that the students really get to engage deeply um, with their own writing and to read texts that they may not be able to delve into as deeply. So, that is what a few things I'll say. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Bob. Hi, everyone. I'm Bob Vivian and um, hi, Karen, I haven't met you, but it's nice to meet you. <laughs> and Leslie, it's good to see you again. And um, so I'm in Roscommon, Michigan, which is where the winter residency is. <laughs> Um, and I'm just really geeked and excited to um, join this program. I was in the Vermont College of Fine Arts for many years where I met Sophronia, the incredible Sophronia. And so, yeah, so I teach uh, creative nonfiction and fiction and um, experimental forms. And so, um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's about it for me. Okay. Yeah. And we also have for you this evening. Oh, let's see. This is letting me move this. Yes. We have real live MFA students for you to meet this evening. Uh, we have with us Maddie Weaver, who is a first semester student, and Joey Meyer, a second semester student. So uh, if Maddie, if you'd like to say a few words before we get going. Uh, thank you for being here. I know you both are, are busy with your MFA work in addition to the rest of your lives. Uh, yeah, it's good. I'm, my name's Maddie. I'm glad to be here. I like how uh, Joey's in both photos that we have here. Yes. On the uh, <laughs> yes, that's, yes. That's, that's great. Um, yeah, as Sophronia said, I'm a first year MFA student. Um, that's it. I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I'm a Michigan resident. And uh, yeah. Thanks, Maddie. And Joey. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Joey. I'm a second semester fiction student. Um, right now, I'm, I'm living in New Jersey along the East Coast. And um, just a, a quick thing on the program, one of the things that I love the, the most is um, kind of like the, the personalized curriculum that we all get to work on um, with our mentors at the residency each term. Thanks, Joey. And we'll get more uh, into that as we go on. Uh, before we 
get to residency specifically, let me tell you about the program so that you understand how it all fits together. So the ALMA MFA is a two-year degree in a low residency format, which means students are only in person twice a year for 10-day residencies. Uh, during the rest of the time, you work one-on-one -on -one with a faculty mentor. And I will explain in a little bit how you come to get that faculty mentor. But during that time, and this is what Maddie and Joey are doing right now, uh, during the, the semester, you submit five packets of work uh, to your mentor each month. It's critical and creative work uh, based on the reading list that you have come up with together. It is a collaboration. And uh, as Joey mentioned, it is very particular, a uh, personalized uh, style of work. And you'll find that you will progress, your writing will grow tremendously in a short amount of time. That is really the beauty of the low residency program. Upon graduation, you will have a tremendous proficiency of writing skills, including a strong use of organization and structure and adept use of language. Um, I like to say that you will have a language for what you do, right? So you will understand what makes you a strong writer. You will be able to wield your work uh, or your, your writing skills with intention. You will have an understanding of, of your craft. You'll be able to read and think critically as a writer. And again, we'll talk about this, how it shows up in residency, but you will also have a strong knowledge of the publishing industry, including how to get your work published in a variety of venues and understanding where your work may fit best in the publishing world. Our residencies take place in the summer and the winter. The summers are in June. Our next one is coming up uh, June 26, sorry, June 16th through the 26th. The summer residencies are here at, in Alma, Michigan, and we are housed in the Wright Lapine Opera House, which is in uh, just down the street, uh, downtown, Alma in this uh, beautiful, restored, historic building. Our winter residency, which we just completed last month, uh, is held at the Ralph A. McMullen Center, a, a beautiful facility uh, near state parks. It's just an hour north of here. Uh, we are going to have a residency in Oxford. It is an optional winter residency. It was supposed to take place this coming January, January 2023. But because of COVID, Oxford is not taking outside students right now. So we're hoping to have that residency happen in 2024. So we go away to these residencies. We're there for 10 days. And what happens? You know, 10 days is a long time. What exactly happens at residency? And that's going to be the focus of our discussion tonight. Uh, we will take you through each feature of residency and both faculty and students will share with you their experiences of each of these components. The first of them being lectures. You will attend a lot of lectures. There will be many on the schedule. There will be lectures from faculty. There will be lectures from our visiting writers. And once uh, you get into your fourth residency, there will be lectures from you. Because as part of the program, you will be writing a critical thesis in your third semester, and you will um, deliver that thesis as a lecture in your fourth residency. So I will open this up to our faculty and students to tell us a little bit about uh, your lecture topics, of uh, what lectures are like, and uh, what is uh, what students can expect of them. Do I have to call on someone or do you to go first? Um, I'll start. I mean, so uh, yeah, so with the, the crack lectures, I, are, are, I think are one of the real wonderful points of, um, a residency is kind of like a turbo education in, you know, craft. And I, you know, I would go, I mean, the nice thing is everyone goes to all the um, lectures. So you really kind of a, a kind of a shared canon of, of knowledge about um, all these different forms. You know, you, I mean, I learned about um, grammar and poetry and um, Leslie did a great uh, 
lecture on uh, disability poetics. It was just wonderful. I mean, and and just learning, you know, just learning all these new ways to to use craft techniques and also just see um, different forms of writing. Um, my own uh, lecture was about creating questions in a narrative and something called the octopus moment, which is about um, creating a plot with reach. And, um, you know, it was, it, you know, I, I think it's fun for the faculty to come up with them, um, uh, you know, topics and, um, you know, things that they really love and, and want to share with the students. Um, I just wanted to add to that, Karen, um, where the faculty are all practicing writers. And I think one of the really exciting thing, uh, things about the lectures um, is that we all bring our own, our own engagement with craft. Um, and we try to talk about those things with students. Um, this past lecture I gave was about how to to write about trauma mm -hmm. and looking at different and uh, the way that different writers um, deal with that and and um, the different ways that uh, craft wise that you can tackle um, difficult emotions and experiences. So oftentimes um, when I'm giving a lecture, it's something that I'm working out in my own writing. Mm -hmm. And I think that other faculty do that as well. And it's, um, we feed off of each other's lectures um, and there's a lot of energy um, when they're given between faculty and students. Yeah. Um, I would add uh, in, uh, in the photo on the top right, that's uh, Jim Daniels giving a lecture. You'll often notice that faculty are in the lectures as well because we are all learning from each other. Uh, as Leslie said, we are practicing writers and we are all, uh, uh, you know, what's the word? Um, we are all, uh, I don't know if compadres is a word, but, but we're all in this together as writers because we are constantly growing. So uh, it's been tremendously energetic to, to feed off of the energy uh, to help our own writing. The, there's a, a lot of diversity in the lectures as well. Um, just from my personal perspective as a student, um, I'm concentrating my studies on fiction, but we get lectures relating to poetry, nonfiction, fiction, everything in between, and all of these different topics and concepts overlap. So um, a, a lecture about voice and poem is going to help me write better voice in my fiction. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. And yeah, that's a good point, Joey, that, um, that all of the students attend all of the lectures. So even if you're not a poetry student, you will be in the poetry lectures and, and you may find that that may influence you to try writing more poetry. Uh, and that's why we have that option in the program that you can do a semester in a different genre if you wanted to experiment with it. Uh, Bob, were you going to say something? Oh, well, just that, I mean, the lectures are just a wonderful opportunity to do a deep dive into something that you just love or are interested in terms of writing. Um, so the last lecture I gave at, at Vermont was, it was, it was entitled, Please Don't Accuse Me of Genre. It, it was just uh, this idea that um, of how, a writer need not be restricted by a particular form um, and can actually come up with his or her or their own genre, as audacious as that sounds. And that it's it's a playground of ideas and um, creativity. And I, I agree with what Karen and Sophronia and Leslie said that it's just, it's just a wonderful opportunity to to look at writing and lectures, not as a fearful academic thing, but that's nothing wrong with that. But it's, it's like, what really excites you as a writer that you wanna explore and you wanna share with someone and you wanna talk about, you know, 
like-minded people. And so I've always found lectures not intimidating, but just opportunities for a broader and deeper discussion. Yeah. Thank you. So lectures, as I mentioned, take up a big part of the schedule, but another large chunk of the schedule is taken up by workshop. Now the workshop, you, as you saw in, in the lecture pictures, you know, everybody's in lecture. That's, that's a big experience and everyone is there. Workshop is the small classroom experience. Workshops are broken down by genre, uh, fiction, creative nonfiction, or poetry. And this is where uh, students read each other's work, critique each other's work, but it's also where uh, the, the faculty can get into a, a deep dive of craft. If there is something that it looks like um, the students are struggling with or some aspect of craft that they, they really don't know or understand, then, then this is where that, that learning happens. Um, actually, Karen, can you talk about what's going on in this particular picture? This is the, the fiction workshop from last summer. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, it was a wonderful teaching experience last summer. So uh, me and Danielle Clayton, who um, is a superstar in um, YA uh, writing, uh, you know, had kind of different ways of approaching uh, writing and, and different sort of craft elements to emphasize. So we created a series of lessons um, about different craft elements, different thoughts on plot, different thoughts on sensory detail and, you know, different ways to do it. And so the first couple of days, we just had talks about craft and then we got to the workshopping. Um, and I think we had a, a, everything written on the board, maybe Joey, who is there, can <laughs> clarify what is on the board. I can't remember. <laughs> but it was, it, it was, uh, I mean, I can't tell you what's on the board, but I know that, that it was, um, it was very um, well organized, right? Like you guys kept those boards for a while, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You were build, you're building upon it. You were building upon the ideas. Yeah. We did, and, and the workshops are intimate too, because not only are, are you critiquing other people's work and your, your peers and classmates' work, but the spotlight is also on you at some point when everybody is critiquing your work. Um, but but it's, a, it's a really um, nice environment that, that, it's a, that it's small like that. Um, so you don't have like these overpowering personalities that um, I think can sometimes pop up in like undergraduate writing programs. Yeah, and um, for me, what I get out of it the most is that like, not just talking about my writing, but talking about other people's writings and what they've done that I really enjoy. So you're, you know, talking about I'm a, a, a nonfiction student, so we're talking about essays in our workshops. Uh, and I remember last workshop, there was just like, one essay that one of my um, compatriots did and was just like really astounded by how she colored her language. And so part of the workshop for me was like, I want to know how to do that better. I want to learn from you. So it's not just about like learning from your mentors or professors or like learning in lectures. You're also learning from each other. You're giving each other little tips. You'd be like, oh, I tried this or like I thought about it like this, um, which is really cool. I need that. Uh, go ahead. Go on, Leslie. I, I was just going to say that's a really good point um, because the workshop is uh, gives students the opportunity to learn how to articulate um, what they see happening in a piece of writing um, and how they um, how they see meaning being developed, or if something is not successful, why in particular it's not working yet. Um, and developing that type of language also helps students with their own work, looking at their own work critically. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Meg. Is workshop, Joey mentioned that, you know, the spotlight is on you when, when your work is being read. So um, Joey or Maddie, can either of you address the fact, I mean, that can be scary, like some writers uh, come to workshop with um, a lot of anxiety. So did, did you feel it was a scary experience? And, and if so, how did you get over that? Not, not a scary experience. 
Um, <clears throat> I, I think the approach that this program ha has taken to it, um, it w was not that it was different than I anticipated, but having been in workshop classes in the past, um, this was not quite the same. Um, it, it, it's less it's less critical and more. I don't want to say abstract, but um, there, there's a certain camaraderie that I feel we have in the workshops, um, partially be, because they're small. Um, I think it, everyone is, is able to be pretty open with one another. Um, and one of the other fiction students, she and I have actually been exchanging emails the past couple weeks about her workshop piece mm -hmm. from the last workshop. Um, and I, I'm, I'm glad that um, Maddie brought it up too, that it, it's surprising how much we actually learn from one another. Um, and, and a lot of us ha have, have really similar goals in that uh, sense as well. Yeah, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like palling around. You're just like hanging out with your friends and you're talking about something that you're really passionate about uh, and you're learning from them and they're learning from you. It can be a little, you know, nerve wracking to be, you know, like there. Um, but my experience has just been nothing but great. Like everyone's like really excited. Like people aren't talking about like all of the things you're not doing or all the things you're doing wrong. People are talking about like the things you're doing right and the things that you're so close to getting perfect, you know? Um, it's really an encouraging process. It's something that you're, you know, you've got this huge body of work in front of you and you have, um, you know, you don't have a lot of time to talk about it. So what people are focusing on are, are like, this is what you can work on, yes, but this is what's really working. You should dig into this more and you should carve this out more um, and really just focus on your strengths. And then, you know, you, you do have weaknesses. Everyone has them. Let's talk together or maybe learn in a lecture about how to make that a little better. Yeah, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about community later, but I think it's important what uh, both Maddie and Joey mentioned that about being in touch with each other in between residencies, right? Um, I realized that the first cohort it took them a while to, to realize that they could do that, that they could contact each other um, away from residency and to support each other as they're working on their packets from month to month. So that, that's really important. So moving on, uh, we mentioned that you're submitting this work to a faculty mentor. Well, how do you get that mentor? This is one of the features of residency. And this happens pretty early on where there's time set aside for a series of interviews. Now, these are kind of like uh, speed dating sessions where all of the faculty are made available and the students uh, take about 15 minutes per interview and go around the room uh, speaking to each faculty mentor about what they would like to work on that term, um, how they see themselves uh, working with each other, uh, what they might read, and just to see who they feel uh, might be a fit for them for that coming term. Uh, once they've done all of these interviews, they will then submit their, um, their top three uh, preferences for whom they would like to work with, and then they have the faculty mentor assigned to them. So, um, so I guess the question is that, that I will ask to our, our um, participants here, our panel, uh, so what happens, what exactly happens in these interviews? What, what are you talking about? What are you asking? The faculty and, and faculty, what are you hoping to learn from the student in these sessions? Um, I guess so. The way it went for me, this is my first time doing it, um, and uh, it was you know we have we had two nonfiction, uh, like two main nonfiction people, uh, and I know Leslie does nonfiction as well, um, but everyone's kind of cross uh, cross discipline as well, so you can kind of just talk to anyone and everyone for the most part. Um, yeah. But the way it played out for me was I kind of just said, hey, this is what I want to work on. And um, these are the things that interest me. And this is what I like to write. Um, and then you're going into this with this mentor person that you're talking with already knows your work because you've submitted this workshop packet. So they've read your work. They kind of know what's going on. They kind of already see what could be useful to you. So they're going to talk about a reading list. Um, they're going to talk about all the books that they know that you might not know um, that are going to really improve your writing overall because the best way to learn is to read um, and overall you're just trying to get to know this person and they're trying to get to know you and you're trying to build this relationship and then start a conversation that's going to last 
um, the six months that follow. Yeah. Yeah, and, and having done this a, a couple times now, it's um, kind of like sitting down with each of these faculty members um, and having a conversation, sort of bringing up what it is I wanna be writing this semester or things I wanna work on or um, what, I, what I wanna be working on better, what I need improvement on. Um, and like the, this, this past residency, um, I spoke with, or I sat down with both Jim and I spoke with Karen and I, I was so curious from, you know, all these different books that I'm hearing that I ended up sitting down and having a one-on-one -on -one interview with um, one of the nonfiction faculty, uh, Matthew Gavin Frank, because there, there are aspects of his writing that I, I really admire. So in, in other ways, I was asking him his opinions on what books he thinks I should read for um, one reason or another. Um, so it, some of the conversations don't necessarily lead to oh my gosh, yes, you, this, you're going to be my mentor, but there's something that we can learn from everybody who's there. And that's a good point, Joey, because uh, part of the degree requirement is that you work with a certain number of faculty throughout your time in the program. It's not as though you get one faculty mentor and you're with that person the, the, um, for the full two years. Um, I want to add when I'm having a conversation with a student as a faculty member, I'm trying to um, understand where they are in their development, um, how the past semester went for them, and if there are any particular ways that I can see um, where they can be challenged. Um, so I will, it, like Joey says, people will come speak to me even if they are have no intention or are outside of my genres um they they have no intention of working with me but they want to hear like books selection suggestions or um talk about a specific crack crack issue so from my point of view it, i'm interested in all the students development and um want to see how i can to help the student uh, improve and um, become stronger writers. Yeah, I, I agree with what Leslie says. I think, you know, finding out about what the student wants, what the student kind of needs to be working on right now. And then also just talking about sort of my own approach and kind of what kind of what I think about when I'm writing or my own kind of values and projects can help the student know a little bit more about me and kind of my strengths as a mentor, which can be different from other mentors, you know, so if I'm a good match for whoever, you know, so I think it's really like just sharing kind of your, who you are as a writer and finding out more about the project. Yeah. Thanks. Karen. Yeah, the, the beauty is it's, it's, it's impossible to generalize because we're all individuals. And so I view my role as a sounding board is to meet the artist where he, she, or they are and listen, really listen to what they want out of a given semester. And then we just talk about books and we talk about art. We talk about, and we just, you know, it's, it's I, the beauty of a program like this from my limited perspective is that there really is no hierarchy. I mean, we're all just artists trying to make art. And so it's, it's just a fantastic conversation to have and wherever it may go is where it should go. And that's the beauty of it is that um, there is no, um, utter template it's it's just two people talking about trying to make art and i think that's a good segue to uh, move into our next part of this which is about the panels that we have on professional development because you do create this art and then where do you want to go with it in the world right and i think a lot of writers get tripped up by this because they think that there is only 
one way to publish and you know it, that it has to be these big New York City publishing houses and that there's only one way of being a success as a writer when really there are many many ways to get your art into the world and that the the best thing is just to to know what publishing is about and the different um, ways it exists in the world. Um, I've been told, and, and maybe um, Karen uh, or someone else can chime in on this, uh, I've been told that that's an unusual aspect of our program is that, that we do talk about professional development. So um, this past winter, we had a panel on small presses and had a, a panel of editors from small presses to talk about what it's like to publish there. Uh, the photo on the, the bottom left is from summer residency and we were talking about literary journals you know what is a literary journal and what it means to be published in one uh, on the right uh, that's the the faculty um, from winter residency uh, just talking about how to live your life once you leave residency right how to how to um, keep going and meld your life into your creation of your art so that you know how to work and and live and so that you don't um, you don't feel that you have to always put your art to the side, um, uh, give it, put it on the back burner to the rest of your life. Uh, I will open it up to everyone to chime in, but but um, to talk about our professional development. I think that I think was. Oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think the panels are immensely helpful. Um, I do have my my undergraduate degree in creative writing. And entering this program, um, I had expressed that I felt like the industry as a whole and publishing was a, a key piece of, of writing knowledge that I was just missing. Um, so it, I, I think it, it is immensely beneficial to all of us. And Karen, what were you going to say? Well, yeah, so I would just, I was going to say just the fact that there's a wealth of knowledge about so many different issues, you know, working on magazines or, you know, grants or, you know, small presses or large presses or agent, you know, so many different aspects of the, of being a writer and placing your work and just living as a writer. And it's a wonderful thing to have the opportunity to share that, I think, and everyone's really eager to as a faculty member too, which I think is unusual and really nice. Yeah. I agree, it is unusual. Um, and I think it it goes along with uh, uh, Alma's um, overall philosophy of you know, giving opportunities to learn about how to develop a thriving writing practice in all the ways that all the possibilities that are there for you. Um. And this is why we also have a, a range of visiting writers who come to us, uh, because yes, we, we have a fabulous faculty, but we also bring in voices who are working in different areas or who are just bringing a special presence to the residency. So um, last summer we had the advantage of having the US Poet Laureate Joy Harjo uh, zoom in for a meeting with us. Of course, she wasn't traveling due to COVID, but she still wanted very much to deliver her craft talk. Uh, visiting writers deliver craft talks. They also uh, deliver public readings and have informal time uh, with the students to talk about uh, both their writing lives, but also uh, their experience in the publishing industry. Uh, I feel uh, when thinking about visiting writers and, and whom to invite, I like to think about bringing writers who will continue a conversation that we have been having at residency. So for example, uh, the writer in the center, David Mura, uh, who is at Winter Residency, uh, um, I invited him to continue a conversation that started in summer residency about race and writing about race and how to write about race and, and who can write about what, and something that, that was you know, really confusing. And, and David has not only uh, spoken about that, he's written a book about it. And, uh, and he actually was, was so eager to be part of our residency that he not only delivered a talk about that, 
he also delivered a fiction uh, lecture as well. So, uh, so it's it's great to have uh, just these different voices. Uh, Khaled Madawa from uh, the University of Michigan joined us last summer. He's a um, MacArthur Grant uh, recipient, for example. So it's it's just as another uh, special aspect to residency. Yeah, I always think of the uh, line from Charles Wright, who said, what lasts is what you start with. And that the impulse to, to write, I mean, if, if it comes out of love, that will never go away. <laughs> and how that manifests itself in terms of a professional career could be very different for all kinds of different people. It could be teaching, it could be actually writing for a living. But I guess just to remember why you were drawn to writing in the first place and to honor that, well, frankly, for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned readings. You will also attend lots of readings. So this is a, a feature of the evenings at residency. The evenings will usually have a public reading. These are events open to the public. Uh, all of the faculty deliver readings as do our visiting writers. And as you can see by Matthew Gavin Frank's uh, pigeon head there, anything goes <laughs> in the reading. Uh, it's a delightful way to, to hear what the faculty are working on, but also it can be inspiring to, to hear uh, what's possible with the written word. And um, I know a lot of my writing has been influenced by the, the energy and, and curiosity that has come of hearing other writers read. Matthew or uh, Joey, what, what has been your experience of, of taking in these readings? Um, yeah, I mean, it's great, like you read these things on paper all the time, but it's it's different to hear it in the author's voice, um, the way they focus on certain words or the way they enunciate, like the way that they treat their writing with such care when they're reading, um, really gives it like an, another layer. And, and, you know, all the people who are at residency as faculty are amazing writers and just being able to hear what they're like, read it on the page and even you know, we took um, in workshop, we looked at some of the writing that the faculty had done. We kind of talked about it a little bit and we did like writing exercises. Um, but then to see that read out loud and just see how that unwraps. Like I'm a, a huge fan of performance. Um, reading, reading, writing out loud is something that I just love uh, more than anything. Um, and to just hear these amazing writers just speak their hearts and deliver these works to you in a way that you're not just staring at a page. It's, um, it changes you in, in, in a great way. And as writers, this is something that theoretically we're going to have to do in the future. So seeing our amazing faculty do this every single night, um, it, like Maddie said, it, it helps us understand their writing better. Um, but also makes an example of um, just how to do this, um, how to get in front of a crowd of people and read your writing in your voice. So it's, it's great to see the um, fine example made. Yeah, it gets rid of the jitters a little bit and then kind of removes that stigma of, you know, I can't stand up here, I can't read. It's like the one example of everybody else is doing it, you can too, that actually yeah. works um yeah yeah and so it's and the reason i'm asking them about this is because they do have to get up there and do this themselves <laughs> another feature of uh residency uh, we hold informal student readings because it is a it is a requirement of the degree program that when you graduate you will have to deliver a part of your creative thesis as a public reading now, we don't expect you to get up there cold and, and have to do this uh, in front of the public. So throughout residency, students give informal readings to practice this very particular um, skill. Uh, 
We even have a special workshop. Uh, we have spoken word artist and bookshop owner um, Don Daniels comes to residency to give a specific workshop to coach the students in their presentation and reading of their own work. So, um, so you're seeing images here from last summer and also from this past winter. Um, Maddie is not playing with his phone. He's reading his work <laughs> off of his phone. <laughs> But, um, but, it, but as you can see, the, the students all support each other and some of them are reading work that they have written uh, over the course of the residency. So it's, it's a really cool uh, way to, to just get the, the jitters out, but also to, to share what you've um, accomplished. Yeah, it kind of feels like team building sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everyone, all your peers, even the faculty, like you're all part of a team. And that is the that is the writing team. Um, yeah, sorry. But, it, you know, it, it really builds that camaraderie and like so you get to know people a little better. Um, you know, we were hearing and I was reading the works of my peers in nonfiction because of the workshops. Mm -hmm. But it's a great way to hear the like for me, hear the poets and the fiction writers like I wouldn't have been able to hear Joey's writing or really know Joey's writing all that well were it not for the student readings, although I could have yeah. easily asked. Um, but the, it's just another avenue for sharing your work with your peers um, and, you know, just learning a little bit more, like you can kind of hear a new story. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit, um, you know, for me, it, it's it, it's daunting when it's, you know, it's it's faculty reading, it's, it's established writers and teachers. When it's the students, it's kind of just like it's it feels more low key. You know what I mean? It's 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 <laughs> um, it's a bit more humbling for me and makes it a little bit easier. I've been do, doing readings for you know over a decade, and and I still get nervous. Like I'm sitting down in that chair because I was like I'm I'm nervous right now. I'm shaking a little bit. I'm gonna sit down and read this one. Mm. Um, but it's it's just a great outlet. Yeah. Um, kind of to add to to what both of you said. Um, first and foremost, it, it's great practice. Um, like I mentioned earlier as writers we're going to have to do this eventually so it, if we have the practice now it, it's only going to help us improve um and, and another thing that is really nice about um the these less formal student readings is um it, it's really a safe space sometimes i mean I, I i read something that was fantasy but someone else might read something that is a really intimate memoir or or poetry and um, the, this group of people has really created a, a safe space to be able to express that via our writing without any kind of judgment. Um, additionally, I, I could get up there and, and stutter every other word and these people are still going to be giving me encouragement. So they're nice. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if this is helpful at all, but one, one thing to maybe consider about giving a reading is that it's, it's not a performance. It's actually your truest self giving voice to that self <laughs> in a space that is safe. And what a beautiful opportunity because I don't know how all of you feel as fellow writers, but performance is what I do on an everyday basis. A reading is actually where it's actually the real person. And so that's to maybe to, to think about that, because um, I know a lot of people think about readings, well, I have to perform, I have to, but, but often it's, it's, actually, it's actually an act of searing vulnerable honesty, which our culture doesn't usually <laughs> uh, support or honor, yeah. Yeah, or honor, yeah. I I like that. I like that. Somehow that's almost scarier, but but it's true. <laughs> it's it's true. Yeah, I was gonna say it's not even residency, and I'm learning stuff. But Bob's absolutely <laughs> right. Like it's 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 100 accurate. It's not a performance. You're actually, you know, you get to drop the, you know drop the veil or the mask or whatever it is for a little bit and just kind of read what you've written and just be as honest as you can be. It's, it's liberating. Yeah. 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 Uh, I will also add that, uh, that as the residencies go on, that the schedule will change because we will have these added 
lectures from students. So, um, so in the coming term, the first cohort will be writing their critical thesis. So come winter, they will be delivering their lectures. Then the following summer, you will have that cohort delivering their public readings. And then Maddie's cohort will be delivering their lectures. So you'll see how the, the schedule will change as the residencies go on. They'll become more and more layered with the different work and experiences of all of the students as they go through uh, their degree process. We also, uh, you know, my favorite part of, of the residency is scheduling activities that take the students outside of the, the normal classroom experience to, uh, to sort of, I don't wanna say shock the system, but, but to get them to notice the world in different ways and to see what that can bring to their writing. So uh, one of the reasons I love uh, Ross Common is because it allowed us to uh, be outdoors in this beautiful, almost like snow globe and do some hiking. Uh, that's actually uh, Joey behind me on the balance beam there when we were hiking. Uh, we went cross country skiing and you didn't have to know how to ski. I didn't know how to ski. So um, we all took a group lesson, um, the people who, who chose to go. Uh, in the top left image there, uh, Anna Clark of our faculty taught an improv class. So um, a way of, of both movement and, and just thinking about being spontaneous. And again, as a tool for creativity. Uh, bottom uh, left is from a stargazing uh, activity that we did. We had a stargazing expert come to winter residency. And, uh, and even though it was cloudy, uh, we actually learned a lot about the stars. But, um, but this, is, this will be an ongoing thing, all sorts of different activities. Uh, Bob can mention uh, that he will be teaching a special workshop this summer that will com culminate in a fly fishing experience. So I, I believe that all of the, the experience uh, that we bring to bear in residency uh, helps the, the writing experience. Uh, I didn't know if you wanted to be able to chime in on this, but yeah, sure. it was nice to get yeah. uh, get away from the classroom a little bit and do some other things. I didn't go cross country skiing because I was afraid of breaking something. Um, but we the 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 bottom left photo, the stargazing was like a really strange lecture. Like it was just yeah. storytelling the entire time, and like a, not strange in a bad way, in a wonderful way. Um, and then we went outside and got to we didn't see any stars because it was too cloudy, but we got to sing at the stars, which was you know, equally fun. Um, and yeah, like Ross Common in particular was great because it's, it's, it's winter, you know, everyone's been um, kind of locked up for years now um, with, with, uh, you know, the pandemic and everything. Um, so to go to another place on almost like a, like a retreat with new people, um, you know, getting to know other people, getting to do things you wouldn't normally do in that season um, was just really great. Yeah, absolutely fantastic experience. And having something like an improv workshop might not immediately sound like it's beneficial to writing until it is. Um, <laughs> and that's one of the things that, that at least I found with it, especially in um, reading my own work aloud is sort of getting out of out of my own comfort zone. It's one thing to to read aloud. It's another thing to read fiction and and give different voices to different characters and doing something like an improv workshop sort of bring brings down the those those barriers and and allows us to really get outside our comfort zones and um, again still in a safe space and yeah. nice. Yeah. We're gonna do uh, we were going to do a bike ride last summer but we got rained out so. We Maybe we can still make that happen this summer. We'll see. The president of Alma, uh, Jeff Abernathy, is an avid cyclist. So he, he was the one that spearheaded that ride. And I'm sure uh, if he's around for our residency, he'll be happy to uh, set that up again.
So the last thing uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, basically it's just the spontaneity, the informal time, the community of writers. Uh, and uh, Joey and, and Maddie spoke about this a little bit, but you'll find that so much happens outside of the classroom in just the, the regular conversation of just being together uh, with people who want to talk about writing, who, who are interested, passionate about this same thing, about creating this art. And there is a magic that comes of being together that just cannot be replicated. And, uh, and our first cohort uh, just totally felt it and they hungered for it. They were so committed to figuring out how we could be in person again this winter, even though the uh, COVID numbers were going up. Uh, we created very tight protocols, but, but it was wonderful to see that people were so committed to, to being together uh, because of that first wonderful experience this summer. But um, can, anyone can chime in here about, about what it's like to just be at residency and the energy that comes from it. Well, I would say just the, the hanging out, um, you know, dinner, you know, like people would go out to dinner, you know, sometimes and, and you can, you know, just hang out and chat about anything writing related or not. And it's just so bonding, you know, and it, it's, it's, it, it's a wonderful experience and it can be very isolating as a writer to be home, you know, working and here's a chance you can just talk about anything, um, you know, with, with other people of the same passion. So I think that's a very special part of it. Yeah, um, I think it's like Sophronia, like that's, that's how we met in Vermont. We were walking to a lecture together spontaneously and it's led to this incredible friendship. <laughs> it's just kind of amazing. And sometimes I think the power of residency is not, please, it's your mentors try to do the best we can, but but it's it's your peers and it's the synergy that you inhabit with your cohort and your fellow writers that is often more informative and sustainable even than what you get in a workshop. I'm sorry, I sound like a heretic here, but but it's 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 a beautiful kind of um, you don't know quite where the beauty will come from, but it will come. You can be assured of that. And that's yeah. kind of amazing. Yeah. And you will be connected to these people long after the program is over and you'll be supporting each other in your writing life for a long time after. I mean, we're, we're all writers at different, different degrees of, of development or different points in our career. Um, and, and as writers, there are certain aspects of what we might call like the, the writer life that other people don't necessarily understand or appreciate, but, and, and, and not that that's necessarily a bad thing, um, but coming to residency, you're surrounded by a group of people who all feel that way, that they, this is part of the writer's life, going to a, a residency and, and, and networking with one another and building these bonds. I am going to stop the screen sharing here and I'm going to open it up for questions. If anyone would like to ask questions of myself, faculty, or any of the students here, I, um, I open the floor and we'd love to hear from you. You can just unmute uh, Anna, Faith, or, or Anna, or Laura, sorry. Faith, are you still in uh, Alaska? I am. Yeah. Um, I, it's um, almost four o'clock here. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess my question is, what are you looking for in um, an MFA student, someone who's um, applying to your school? I know that MFA programs are very competitive and um, 
I want to know what you all are looking for. If you can share that at all. We can share that. Well, I guess I will go first. <laughs> Everyone's positive. Uh, Faith, we want to see, number one, uh, potential, right? That, that you are committed to this process of learning and mm -hmm. that you are open to learning, right? So it's, it's not about coming to the table with a project that, that you've already written and all you really want is somebody to edit this manuscript. That's, you know, that you won't get, um, you won't get what you want out of the program, right? Because there's so much more to learn. So it's about being, we're looking for someone who's open to that learning um, and someone who is open to reading, right? Someone who is, is uh, going to be on this journey, right? Um, because it would be frustrating for you as well as your faculty men mentor if, if you are um, stuck on a particular road and, and not open to changing it. So you, you'll be frustrated because you're stuck on this road and that's going to be frustrated because you're not you know, taking any suggestions. So, um, so you can see how that would be difficult, but, um, but, but we're looking for people who are wanting to, to bring some energy to this artistic community. You think you can do that? Oh yeah. <laughs> I think I can do that. Um, I've been looking for a place where my voice can be heard and I, I think that can happen at Alma. You all are very diverse in the students that you choose and, and the faculty and who you've had there in the past and who you will have coming in the future and with you being here also, being there I mean. So Farania, I talk with um, other students of color who have been in other MFA programs and they have not always felt welcome and their voice has not always been heard when they brought up the issue of race. And, and so in fact, they were downplayed and they end up leaving those programs. And I, um, I, I, don't, I feel I will get the support that I would need at Alma to do that kind of writing. Um, just Absolutely. hearing someone mention about trauma um, which I do have an interest in. I am a Presbyterian pastor in, um, in Alaska at this time. And I will be leaving here probably in May because I want to be closer to family. Mm -hmm. I also want to be um, at a church that would give me the time to work on an MFA program. Um, mm -hmm. I'm the senior pastor here and it's, um, it, it, I wouldn't be able to do that, do any kind of degree program when being in that kind of program. But I, um, so um, I guess I'm saying all that to say is that I feel really comfortable. I, I think I would feel comfortable at Alma. I had yeah. asked you the first question because I'm not an expert. Um, I, I haven't really had anything published. I have worked as a writer and I've had things published at my seminary. I have a master's of divinity. Um, but, um, and so I just want to make sure you were looking for someone that had books already that was published. Yeah. Um, you don't I have to be published. When I saw your, um, the first video you mentioned about the pandemic and people maybe um, coming to a new awareness of things, that is kind of what happened to me during the pandemic. I feel mm -hmm. led to do ministry in a different way. I feel led to go back to my writing. Um, I do have a bachelor's in English literature and I had a concentration in um, creative writing and Latin American studies, but that was years a long time ago. And so um, I do write sermons every every week. So that has kept me on my toes um, in terms of whether you're really ready or not, people want to hear a sermon every week. So that has been engaging in my writing. Um, I, I wasn't quite sure what you're looking for in terms of a, um, a manuscript because I mean, I saw what it, I think it's 25 pages. Yeah. So I would be interested more in the creative nonfiction program, even though I have an interest in um, everything. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know what to send you all in the meantime that will be considered um, acceptable 
for a creative nonfiction program. I've had friends tell me who've been in MFA programs that maybe I could um, take some of my sermons and expand them mm -hmm. and, um, and take out the part about Jesus. <laughs> And because it's it's preaching, so I'm, I'm not quite sure what to send yet. I was thinking of um, applying for sometime next year, anyway, to give me more time. And so, because I, I am going to be in transition, my family will also be relocating um, from okay. where they are. So I'm looking at 2023 in the fall. But in okay. the meantime, but I did want to start working now, and I did want to know if you have a is it too early to start applying? And anyway, I'm probably, I know I'm asking several questions, so I'll stop now. Okay, no. Um, some. So since you're not applying until next year, I recommend, Faith, that you use this time to generate a nonfiction manuscript. And the reason I say this is because even if you, even if you did do that, even if you, you did like rework a sermon and submit it, you would still have to submit something for workshop. And if, if you did that, it's my sense that that's probably not the thing that you would, be, you would want to be working on. So I recommend that, that you create the manuscript of the thing, of the writing that you want to be doing, right? Okay. So, so that you can, number one, start working on that. But number two, it can be the work that you get to jump in with right away when you do come to residency. You, this is the work you can take to workshop. Okay, that yeah. helps. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if I may, I, I will say that um, I had a, 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 a similar thought when I was applying. I was I was very sure that I wasn't going to apply this past year. I was going to apply next year. Um, I kind of stumbled upon Alma accidentally just driving by while my partner was looking to purchase a car. Uh, and within five minutes of me sending an email, Safranya called me on the phone when we were getting gas and we had a quick conversation. Um, and I was like really motivated, but I just knew that like timing wise, I wouldn't be able to get it to the next year, but I started working on writing and I kind of focused and, and, you know, put some things down on paper and brought some things out of, out of storage to work on a little bit. Um, and then I kind of just last minute had enough writing that I was like, you know what, I'm going to apply and I'm going to go for it and submitted that along with everything. Um, and as Sophronia said, if you're, you know, if you have something that you want to work on or in the future know kind of what you want to do um starting on it now you know might help you get a jump on it um but it also might you know give you kind of inspiration to apply sooner and jump in sooner and get started sooner thank you yeah thanks maddie to... laura did you have any questions Thanks. Um, it does sound like then that you could start either in the summer or in the winter. Correct. Yes. Okay. But and Maddie just started in the winter. Yeah. It sounds like your first cohort is wrapping things up or in their second year. Is that? No, they've just completed their second, they're in their second term, their second semester. Okay. How many have participated in that first cohort? There's about 15 in that first cohort. And is there a number that you're looking for in all the cohorts? Are you trying to keep it small like that? Uh, ideally, yeah, they would be small like that, but you should know that the winter cohorts tend to be smaller because people tend to like to start in the summer. So if you Want a larger cohort? You can start in the summer. Want a smaller one? You start in the winter. Can you talk a little bit about the packets? What what that's like when you're spending time after the residencies? Yeah. So, uh, would you like to hear from a student about how you mean? How are they working through the packets? In and what is that like? Yeah. Um, so I can, I suppose, speak a little bit to that. Um, so that it'll be different for every student um, because we're we're all working on on different things. Um, I know because I'm I'm as a fiction student, um, I'm producing a few things for each packet, which um, 
for the timing, it's about a month per packet. Um, so for each packet, I, I create a creative manuscript, which is about 65 to 7,500 words. Um, and that's new creative fiction that I'm submitting. Um, in addition to that, every other month, I, um, I have a critical essay that is, is nothing too daunting. It's like three to four or five pages, um, usually incorporating a concept of, of writing that I've been studying based on the reading that um, I've decided with my mentor ahead of time. Um, and then we do write a letter to our mentor when we give our submission that kind of goes over our writing process, um, any specific questions we have. Um, and then our mentors will essentially write us a letter back and give us feedback on everything for that individual packet. Um, but I don't, I'm not writing an essay every single month. So I'm, I'm only doing that, like I said, every other month. So for the month of February, I'm, I'm much more concentrated on um, my creative manuscript. While the books that I'm reading, I won't be incorporating into an essay, but rather using those to continue a discussion with my mentor. Um, Is it something where your mentor changes every term? Yes. So the... And the the interviewing piece happens every residency and you get assigned a different mentor each term. Okay. And can you help me with what is meant by creative nonfiction? Yeah. Yes. Go on, Maddie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I am a creative nonfiction student. Um, I start, I got my start in writing. I have a, a BA in writing. Um, and that was a nonfiction emphasis as well, but that was a decade ago that I got that. Um, so creative nonfiction is, is, is a creative approach to nonfiction. Um, it's telling a story that is rooted in reality in some way, encompassing research. Um, you know, some will look to memoir, um, some will look to travel writing. Um, Matthew Gavin Frank, uh, one of our faculty is, uh, uh, a great food writer and a lot of his stuff is it's not all about food but he's like his stories he uh, has a book called the mad feast and it's short essays on regional dishes from around the united states um, and some of them are just really wacky like really out there um, one of them if, if i can spoil it a little bit one of the ones he read at uh, residency was about a um, ever incarnating beaver um, which and it was you know the, you have these fictional elements these elements of fiction and magical realism and playfulness into nonfiction. Um, nonfiction can kind of just be whatever you want it to be. Um, so is the historical fiction considered creative nonfiction or not? No, because, so let's put it this way. Creative nonfiction is when you're bringing fictional elements to make nonfiction beautiful, right? And in terms of the way you tell a story, you're not making things up. Right. With historical nonfiction, you are. Right. Because um, because you're making up scenes, um, you're uh, you have no way of knowing if um, Nathaniel Hawthorne really said this to his wife. Um, a lot of the nonfiction like uh, My Dear Hamilton. Right. So focusing on the stories of, of uh, the fam uh, famous wives of, of um, famous men. Right. Um, it's fiction. It's fictionalized accounts. So stories that are made up of how we think these people may have lived. And I tell you this because I write historical fiction as well. <laughs> and I write creative nonfiction. But it's a good question because I was a journalist for very many years and I did not know the term creative nonfiction when I started my own MFA. And I thought I said, you know, what is that? That sounds like something I would have gotten fired for in my old job, you know? Uh, so, and actually it was on one of those walks that, um, uh, that Bob Vivian here said to me that I should be writing creative nonfiction. And I did not know what in the world he was talking about, but it turned out he was right that I should. And I am, and I do. And I've written several nonfiction books now, so. Thank you very much, Dr. Vivian. <laughs> so. 
Oh, thank you, Froni. I, I would just, <laughs> I, Laura, to answer your question that that CNF, one thing it does so beautifully is like all of us as humans, we we have memories and we, I remember this, this happened. But then we also have these gaps where we say, well, I don't remember this, but this is what I imagine. And that's totally legit for CNF. I mean, if, if you clue the reader in to say, well, I don't remember what my father looked like when I was six years old, but this is what he looked like to me. Yeah. And then, then you are using the, that's where the creative aspect of nonfiction is. Like the beautiful poet Jamal May said, you know, the memory is, memory is incredibly creative. It's not necessarily, and I know this is, we have to imagine things we don't remember. And that's okay. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that is necessary. And as long as we clue the reader into that we are imagining what we don't remember, that is also CNF. So that's, it's, it's very close to poetry in a lot of ways, because it's, you know, it's, it's the great writer Cynthia Ozick said that creative nonfiction and poetry are spiritual cousins they are related to each other. So I would just offer that as grist for <laughs> your own ruminations about the form, but you can do anything in CNF as far as I can tell, maybe that's <laughs> saying too much. Are there sources for financial assistance to help with the cost of the program? The financial office can help you see what you can apply for. Everyone is encouraged to uh, submit the FAFSA, you know, the, the government student aid form. Uh, but one source that I can definitely tell you about that is the Refer a Writer program. And if you look at our website on the main page, on the left side, there is a bar there that says Refer a Writer. And you can have someone, uh, a friend, a, a teacher, a fellow writer, you can have someone fill that out for you. Someone who says, um, here's Laura. Um, it's, it's not a recommendation letter. It's just a form letting us know who you are and saying, this is a writer who might be interested in your program. So that person fills it out, sends it to us. And if you matriculate in the program, you would get a $2,000 scholarship in that person's name. Along the line of the recommendations that you um, look for with the application. Yes. Does it need to be someone who knows a lot about your writing? Or no, it does not, because because there are people okay. who come to the program who either haven't been writing or they haven't been showing their writing, right? Or they've been, you know, in a different industry. So what we look for in the recommendation is someone who can speak to the fact that you are a responsible person, that you have time management skills, that you would be able to handle a program like this, and that um, you would do well in community, that, that you would be uh, a great addition to our artistic community. So someone who knows you. Anything else? So for again, great, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just I gonna say to, those are great questions, Laura. Thank you. I yes, wanted Laura. to say something um, in response to Faith's question or, or, or your comment about Alma being inclusive. Um, I attended a low residency program myself and um, I, have heard stories as well of, of um, students from marginalized communities not feeling like their stories were being heard or where they were in safe places where they could express them or uh, get as much uh, care as the other students for their narratives. Um, and that is something very special uh, about Alma is that the faculty and the students value everyone's perspective and we value that everyone has 
a story or a poem or a piece of nonfiction um, that is completely their own. So that, that's something that makes us stand out, I think, because not every program has that type of environment. And just to just to dovetail on Leslie's comments, I mean that's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of this program is because Sophronia is leading it, and I feel that it really is dedicated in a very real way to diversity. So I totally agree with Leslie. It's it's kind of rare. Yeah, I also want to chime in and say there is something very special about this community and it, it just feels very warm and just really wonderful. And it is Sophronia's vision and the incredible faculty and then the students who then, you know, kind of are nourished by all this. So it's really, it's really great. That's what I thought. So thank you all so much for confirming it for me. Yeah. Um we mean it, uh, that your voice matters, right? It says that on the website and that is the, the vision and that's what we do. We help you to bring your voice to its fruition, yeah. Well, if there are no other questions, thank you all for being here. Uh, if you're watching the recording, thank you for listening. And if you want to get in touch with me or with any of the other faculty, our website is alma.edu slash MFA. Our contact information is there. Our application deadline for the summer residency is May 1st. Our summer residency this year is June 16th to, to the 26th. And we would love to have you as part of our next cohort. Thank you so much. I will see you again very soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you all for coming.